Gospel chapter 1 this morning, John chapter 1. We're going to be looking at John 1 in just a moment. I'll be reading the first 18 verses. You know, I love hearing personal accounts and stories of individuals, and probably my favorite account teller or storyteller was my late father who passed away in 2015. I love listening to him share stories from his past. I'll just share a few of those that have stuck with me. He told me the story once. He played football for a famous coach, Gordon Bragg, and Coach Bragg was a no-nonsense. He couldn't, Coach Bragg couldn't have lasted in these days because if a kid got in trouble, he would kick the guy off the team, and they might be an hour and a half away, and they wouldn't ride in the bus back. <laughs> get in trouble doing those things. Well, my mom was dating my dad, and and my dad was on the football team, and she went to see him play, and he was receiving the opening kickoff, and so she was looking for my dad, and my dad wasn't there. Coach Bragg had kicked my dad off the team. Uh, Fifteen minutes earlier, she said, rather than on the field, my dad was making a circle trying to figure out what to do next. But one thing about Coach Bragg, his temper was always short. So by the second half, my dad was reinstated. (laughs) Also, uh, they shared about the day that they were married. My dad uh, went bird hunting the day before he got married, and mom said that he was so deaf, he wasn't sure when to answer the minister. I'm finally, I'm glad he finally figured it out, and that's why I'm here today. Um, And then there was the famous story, uh, I can eat, but my dad could really eat. One day he came in from work, and he ate five hamburgers with buns, and I'm not talking about little ones, I'm talking about good-sized hamburgers. And uh, he thought he was going to eat the hamburgers and just kick back in his recliner and enjoy some rest that night. But the cows got out and he ended up having to chase them for two hours. I could go on and on about stories. But my dad would share the humorous stories. But then there were stories where he taught me a lesson. One was humorous and taught me a lesson. Uh, There was the infamous time when my dad was in Richmond and Uh, needed directions. And so, you know, most of us men were hesitant to get directions. My dad, I found out there's a reason he was hesitant because this time as a young man, he stopped, asked directions. A man was briskly moving down the sidewalk. And we found out later that my dad had asked a man who had just robbed a store for directions. The guy was fleeing from authorities. I don't know what was worse, my dad asking him or the man looking back over and yelling where to go next. So I learned from him, be careful who you get advice from. But there were other stories that were beneficial to me, like uh, he taught me about perseverance. We would go to Holiday Lake, and he would show the greatest length of the lake. He'd say, Rick, when I needed to be a lifeguard, he wasn't like it is today. It was rigorous. He said we had to prove that we could swim all the way across Holiday Lake, and he taught me about perseverance. He told me the time he studied electrical engineering at Virginia Tech and how he, uh, after Thanksgiving, he had an exam, and he was certain that he had failed the exam, and by God's grace, he passed it, I believe with a D, but at least uh, he passed it, and he taught me how God is, is faithful. But then there were also the stories that were brief in nature. Uh, his mother passed away at the age when my dad was only 17, but I always enjoyed those little times when he could grasp and talk about the passing of his mother. You know, I love listening to accounts. I think that's why I enjoy reading biographies probably more than any other type of literature. I love to hear stories. This church has its own story. The late Ellen Beasley and Mabel Falp, I believe, were integral in our last church history back in 1977 of accumulating a written history of our church. I was thinking this week it's probably about time uh, that we uh, add to that. So this church has its story. But every one of us has a story to tell. And so today, the title of the message is Weave a Story to Tell. In no book better than John can we read about the story of Jesus. We can read about the story 
of those who told the story of Jesus. In fact, very early in Jesus' ministry, it was normative for people to tell other people about Jesus Christ. And so in this series of messages, we've a story to tell. We're going to look at John 1 through the end of John chapter 3 over these next couple of months. And we're going to do so. There's so many angles we can take. But I want to look through the lens of those who told the story of Jesus. And so we're going to begin this morning in John 1 and verse 1. It says there, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. The Apostle John here is telling the story, the account of Jesus. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. We know that to be John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, those who believe on his name, who were born not of natural descent, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, uh, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son who is himself God, and as his Father's side, he has revealed him. Let's pray. Our Father, as we look to your word today, Lord, every one of us has a story to tell. Like John the Apostle, who wrote this account. Like John the Baptist, who verbally spoke of the truth of Jesus. And Lord, even Jesus himself, as we see in these weeks ahead, how he attests, Lord, to his own deity, his own lordship. Uh, Father, as we move in this spring of the year, Lord, a time of life, may we spread the message of life through Christ. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, among the four Gospels, John's Gospel begins at the earliest point. Uh, Matthew and Luke, they share the birth narrative of Jesus. But John goes all the way back even before the beginning of time as we know it. And so John begins his gospel by speaking of the preexistent Christ, of the Christ who was with God, the Christ who is God, the Christ who was the agent of creation. And then he moves very quickly uh, to begin to talk about the beginning of Jesus' public ministry uh, in his time of adulthood. Again, there's no Christmas story, yet we see that John shares some pertinent information about Christ that helps us. It especially helps us as we're looking at sharing the story of Jesus Christ. We have the privilege, we're going to see in John chapter 3, of how Jesus engaged one Nicodemus and began to share with him the truth about himself. And so as we're going to be talking, and you'll probably hear it so much over the next few weeks, you might say, I wish Rick would quit talking about this, but we do have a story to tell. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have an account about Jesus Christ. In fact, you have what you might call your story. But then there's also the story, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the beautiful ways that we can commute or communicate rather our story and his story is as they come together and we share about who Christ is and how he can impact a life. 
You see, we have a community here who needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. If our church doesn't do it and the church down the road doesn't do it, then who is going to communicate the truth of God's word? We're living in days today that if we're not careful, we can be discouraged. We can look at the news. We see the news. Things being leaked. Uh, security being breached, all of these things, the threat of what's going on around us. People want to hear the gospel of Christ. We've had the blessing two of the last three weeks. We've been able to get into the community. And I have been shocked and surprised at how receptive people are. Uh, They're wanting and seeking truth. And we have that truth. We have a story to tell. Here in uh, John chapter 1, we see that John begins to tell the story. He begins to relate who Jesus is. And I want to look at a few points this morning. And the first thing he communicates to us in written form, John uh, the Apostle, is this. Jesus is the eternal God. He eternally exists far beyond what our finite minds can understand in the past, far beyond the future. God is self-existent. Jesus is the eternal God. Jesus is unique and distinct. There's none like him. He alone, he alone is Lord. He is fully God, and when he walked on this earth, he was fully man. In God's economy, in regard to Jesus, One plus one equals one. Fully God, fully man in one person. And and I've said it before, it may not make sense to you or to me, but follow this. God as creator is not subject to the laws of creation. Because usually when we look at it, we try to look at God and put him in the box of creation. I'm a created being. I can't be two in one. I can't be two persons in one. I'm Rick Caldwell. But I am a creation subject to the laws of creation. The creator is not so subject. And so verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word. In in my translation and probably yours, that word is capitalized. It is a reference to Jesus Christ. And the word was with God and the word was God. Now, how do we know that it's referencing Jesus Christ? Because look at what verse 14 said. The word did what? Became flesh and dwelt among us. Who became flesh and dwelt among us? That was Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That word image is the word from which we get icon. It is a visual representation of who God is. Can we know all that God is? God is far more than our minds can ever imagine. But he has revealed himself to us through Jesus Christ. One time we read later in John's gospel in chapter 8, that Jesus was talking to a group of religious leaders. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. Now you need to follow this. Abraham uh, walked this earth hundreds of years before that time. And they were saying, you're not even a hundred years old. How can you say that you're that? But Jesus was saying not only that he predated Adam, but Jesus very selectively used the word I am, which God the Father gave to Moses when Moses asked, whom shall I say sent me when I go to the people? And so Jesus was not just claiming that he predated Abraham, but he was stating that he is God. But secondly, not only is he fully God, but as the eternal God, Jesus is the agent of creation. Jesus was not just present, sitting back and watching the other two persons of the Trinity in the act of creation, but he was active in creation. I like what one commentator, Matt Carter, said, from sunflower seed to tallest redwood, everything comes from and through Jesus. Again, as we look at Colossians 1, not verse 15, where it says that he is the image of God, but verse 16, it says everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominion or ruler or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. 
So he is the agent of creation. But not only that, we see in verse 3, the agent of creation, all things were created through him. Apart from him, not one thing was created. But in verse 4, in him was the life, and that life was the light of men. Not only is he the creator, Jesus Christ is the sustainer. He is the light. He is the life of men. Light does what? It repels darkness. It supplants darkness. Light, in this case, is the truth. And it's closely related to life. Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus Christ is life. And so we see in these first four verses, it's very clear. Remember, John's telling the story in written form under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who Jesus is. Is. But I want you to see in verses 6 through 9 and also in verse 15 that there was a witness that attested to this verbally. And his name was John, not the writer of John, but another John. You know, we have uh, a number of names that are used of multiple people here. And I may say Paul. One time we had Paul Singer. We had Paul McNulty was here. And we had uh, two different uh, names, but they were two different individuals. And so John writes the gospel, but he writes about another John, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. He was the one who prepared the way for Jesus' public ministry. What do we know of John the Baptist? This one that we read in verse 6 that there was a man sent from God named John. Well, John was an older relative, a cousin to Jesus Christ. We read that in Luke 1, 36. He was a man of the earth. All right. He ate stuff we probably wouldn't eat. Uh, yesterday I was hanging uh, with my daughter and there's this uh, place, this restaurant called Roots. And I was thinking, well, my dad, Jack Caldwell, wouldn't have eaten at any place like that. I don't want to eat stuff that's below the ground other than maybe potatoes. But, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, John the Baptist ate stuff that you and I might not. He was a man's man. He, he lived off the earth. He was revered by many. Remember when they tried to trap Jesus in the last week of his life? And he said, John's baptism uh, was that of man or of God. If they had said of God, Jesus would have said, uh, why don't you believe what he said about me? But he realized that if they said of man, the people would turn against them. Why? Because John the Baptist was revered of people and feared by the establishment. He was a prophet in the spirit of Elijah, the forerunner of the Lord. But what does John say about himself? You know, someone else can speak about him and we see that. What does John say about himself? Look at Verse 8, he was uh, not the light. John, the gospel writer, says he was not the light, John the Baptist, but he came to testify about the light. So what do we know about John the Baptist? Well, John the writer says he was not the light, but what did John the Baptist do? He came to testify about the light, not to testify about himself. Now, this was a great man. In fact, in Matthew 11, Jesus said, among those born of women, none exceeded John the Baptist. None, he said. He was esteemed of Jesus. He was esteemed of the religious leaders. But look, it wasn't about him. He came to testify about the light. He didn't seek to draw attention to himself. In fact, before we finish this study in, in John chapter 3, we're going to see that he says, I must decrease, John the Baptist, and Jesus must increase. So he was not the anointed one. John the gospel writer makes that clear, and he made it clear himself. He was not uh, the anointed one, but he pointed to the anointed one. Well, who was he? Verse 7. He came as a witness, someone to bear testimony about the light. He came to speak about Jesus. Now, it's very important as we begin to think about our own lives to understand John the Baptist here. He stayed in his lane. John the Baptist was esteemed by people. He could have easily drawn attention to himself, but instead he pointed to Jesus. He knew and carried out his purpose. 
This series of messages is focusing on our telling the story of Jesus Christ. It is not, although we should love our church, say, come to our church and you're going to have a great time. Yeah, we do want people here. It's not to point people to a preacher. It's not to point to a ministry. We're to point to Jesus Christ. We're going to look not just at John the Baptist. We're going to look at Andrew. We're going to look at Philip. We're going to look at Nathaniel. And we're going to see in all of those that they understood that the answer is Jesus Christ. And we have that answer, those of us who are in Christ. We have the answer the world needs. The answer is Jesus Christ. And if we're going to be effective, we do not need to promote ourselves, our ministries. We need to promote Jesus Christ. I recently read the story of a lady named uh, Peggy DeNoyers. And Peggy was a psychiatric home health nurse. She had worked in the field for a while, and Wanda was one of her patients. Wanda had faced extreme depression, not just normal depression, but excessive depression, and it caused her to have to go to an inpatient facility for a while. And when Wanda was uh, released from the inpatient facility, um, Peggy was given responsibility to visit her in the home. And so Peggy would listen to her and share things with her. And Peggy felt good about Wanda, that Wanda was improving, but she never stopped really to share Jesus Christ with Wanda. Well, a few months passed and Peggy arrived at Wanda's home. The door was ajar and she thought something may be wrong. Entering the house, she saw Wanda's lifeless body and she immediately began to panic. But once everything calmed down, she realized that Wanda had passed away. And beside her were two things, an empty bottle of pills, and then a note from her to Peggy, which said, I'm so sorry, Peggy. I tried it your way. I got tired. Please forgive me. When Peggy received that note, she immediately dropped on her knees and she confessed to God. She said, that's the problem, God. I told her my way. I didn't tell her your way. And she resolved to do that. People, we're to tell people his way. We're to point people to him. John, the gospel writer, John, the Baptist, they attest to the fact that Jesus is the anointed one. At the inception of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist made it very clear this is about Jesus. But then I want you to see a third truth from the text this morning. Jesus is the God who reaches. You do not have to wonder, does God love me? Jesus is the answer. Jesus came to this earth because he loved us. That simple verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to repeat again. You'll get tired of it. We're to tell the story. We're to reach this community, our friends, our family, with the gospel of Jesus Christ over the next few weeks. And we are culminating this series of messages on May 21st for an outdoor service. Now, I promise you I won't challenge my dad and eat five hamburgers that day. I might want to, but I won't. Yeah, we can look at that as the church that day, May 21st, and say, man, it's going to be fun. I look forward to seeing all my friends in church. I look forward to eating. We're going to have a great time. It's going to, and if we're not careful, we're thinking about me, me, me. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to hang with the people in the fellowship. Don't get me wrong. Fellowship is great. But the purpose of this is to bring people in our community out to hear the gospel of Christ, to bring people into the fellowship. People, we've got to be telling the story. Pray for good weather, but we're going to go with it whichever way. And it's good to know that we're on this task with him. God is already reaching. You say, how do you know it? Jesus. 
He's already reaching. He's already come. There are two passages that affirm the truth that God is already working. So if you invite someone, you don't have to say, God, are you working? The very fact that God is prompting you, God's already working. Luke 15, the first two parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin. The shepherd went out looking for the sheep, and last I heard, a coin doesn't look for anything. The one who lost the coin was looking. And that's a picture of God who's actively pursuing us. And then in Romans 3, uh, verse 11, the second part of the verse says, there is no one who seeks God. So how can someone be found? Is it just by chance? No, God is looking for that one. And as we go out into our community, as we invite our friends that are unchurched, that don't know the Lord, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that person, if they don't know the Lord, they're not looking for him. But the better news is God's looking for them. And guess who's greater? God. God's greater. So God is looking for them. God is already working. We don't have to wonder about that. While there's bad news that we may say, I don't see any sign that there's any interest there. God is already working. And John 1 pictures our God on mission. You want to know who's the greatest missionary who ever lived? Jesus Christ. Because he came the greatest distance. You know, we send missionaries from here to third world countries. He came from heaven to earth. And at the greatest cost, his very life. Well, what do we see about our God on mission? The first is this, he became flesh. The eternal God who cannot be contained, wrapped himself for season in human flesh, lived a perfect life. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Secondly, he did dwell among us. He did not just come and show up in a remote part. He intermingled. He dwelled among his people. Thomas Aquinas said, when you and I want to convert a person to our view, we go to where that person is, take that person by the hand, and guide him or her. You don't stand across the room and shout toward him and her or her. Don't order that one to come where you are. You start where that one is. That's what Jesus did. He loved us so much, he went. The shepherd went to the lost sheep. Uh, the owner of the coin went to the lost coin. Notice the activity of God in these verses. Verse 9 tells us this. The true light that gives light to everyone was what? Coming into the world. He was coming into the world. Verse 10. He was what? In the world. He came to us. He dwelled among us. Uh, verse 11, he came to his own. Who are his own? The Jews. And his own people did not receive him. They handed him over to be crucified. He dwelled among us. Verse 14, that word dwell literally means tabernacle. It means to pitch the tent. In the days when the people worshiped in the season of the tabernacle, the tabernacle moved and the people moved. He dwelled among us. And then in verse 15, John makes it very clear uh, that he, the Lord Jesus, was coming after him. All of these words are words of pursuit. But then I want you to see third, he and his person reveal God to us. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. Seeing Jesus is seeing God. You know, God did not sit in heaven with his arms crossed, waiting for a darkened world to come to him. No, he came to us. And in this, I believe, he sets the example for the body of Christ. We're not to sit in between the walls of this church trying to find our own comfort and our own circle of friends although we need the fellowship. We're to be like Jesus, reaching out to others. In closing, I was thinking this past week about my three children. I'm thankful all three of them have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But as I stand before you today, my two oldest children, 
did not come to Christ directly through my ministry. That was not the time when they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our oldest son, Wilson, accepted Christ during the Easter season as a result of uh, production at New Life, Assembly of God Church. I see, Chris, you might have been in that play. Uh, and here I was, a preacher at a Baptist church. My son went to another church. They were sharing the gospel, and that was the moment he believed. Years ago, we had a revival service here, and my daughter Whitney was about six years old. Can a six-year-old believe? Sure can. She's walking with God now. She's teaching right as I'm teaching now. She's teaching in the church. She believed on the Lord. But she didn't follow at that moment, respond unto my preaching. I'd invited a guy named Al Miller that we met when we went to Camp Cherokee, probably when Charlie went years ago. His church, a small church, went along with us. I got to know him. Um, I invited him to come preach revival. And my daughter responded when somebody other than me from this pulpit was preaching. That's humbling. Now, I will say this. John Mark got saved under my preaching. <laughs> but the point I'm bringing is this. I'm thankful for that drama that was presented because that communicated the gospel. I'm thankful for Al Miller who was faithful to preach the word. And I ask you this. Who may be waiting for you to share a witness with one of their loved ones? Who? Like John the Gospel writer, John the Baptist too, we have a story to tell. To whom will we tell it? The scripture says not everyone will receive him. But I like verse 12. But to all who did receive him, to them gave he the right to be called children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, verse 13, not of natural descent, he's not talking about physical birth, or of the will of the flesh, of a mother or father, or of the will of any man, but of God. Born spiritually, spiritually, through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we have a story to tell. And the story is this. We have a God who loved us so much that he came to us. And Father, there are people in our circles, in our community, in our family, our friends, who have yet to believe on you. And Lord, we know they may well not be seeking you, but God, we take comfort in the fact that you are seeking them. And Lord, the greater of the two is you. Father, it may be that some of us, that we may be the instrument that you would use to, to share the gospel that a praying parent has prayed that that child might hear or a friend. Lord, help us to be faithful to carry out the message of Christ. And Lord, we lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.